If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. The opening of Pandora's box would have grave consequences. At Athena's behest, Kratos had sought and won the treasure in order to kill Ares with the power within it. But what Kratos did not know was that the box contained the great evils of the world that were created during the Olympians' war with the Titans so long ago. When Kratos opened Pandora's box, those evils were released and the corruption of Olympus began, but something else was within it, something that would slumber within Kratos himself. For the Olympians, violence, paranoia, greed, lust, hatred, fear, these traits would be amplified within the gods over time. But as for Kratos, other things weighed on the mind of the new god of war. Kratos was haunted by the death of his family, but now too, the memory of his mother and his brother Deimos weighed upon him. He did not know what had become of them, yet he felt compelled to search them out. So Kratos departed from Olympus to seek out answers. He was drawn to the temple of Poseidon within the city of Atlantis. Aboard his ship, Athena speaks to her half-brother, telling him that she does not think this wise. His dreams were merely dreams, nothing more. Kratos believes that this is different, though. These are visions that perhaps he can change. It's too late for Lysandra and Calliope, but it may not be for his mother Callisto and his brother Deimos. Athena asks of him to abandon this road, as though fear has gripped her thoughts. But Kratos refuses, and his voyage to Atlantis continues. The god Poseidon strikes out against his ship to prevent him entrance to his temple, and sends his great beast Scylla to intercept the god of war. Kratos doesn't kill the Guardian, but deals enough harm to it that it flees the battle. Atlanteans are being cut down by Poseidon's own forces while they hunt down Kratos. Anyone who gets in their path is a target, even the innocent. But within Atlantis, Kratos finds a clue as to why he felt drawn here. Parts of the city were built before the time of the Olympian gods, and here there are remnants of the Temple of Thanatos, the god of death. Possessing something called the Skull of Ceres will grant him passage through the Death Gate. This gate is not apparent, at least not yet, but now he knows that it exists and that there is a way to open it. For now, he pushes on through the city. The entrance to the Temple of Poseidon is safeguarded with a test to those who wish to enter. Know thyself and your path shall be revealed. For Kratos, this is a vision of his brother and his mother. In the vision, a young Kratos and Deimos are practicing combat together. Then their mother calls them into the house. Following them inside, Kratos finds his mother Callisto in the flesh and blood. When she calls to him, Kratos initially believes it to be a trick of the gods, but when she promises it truly is her, he sits at her bedside and begins to comfort his clearly unwell mother. Kratos does not know the truth of his birth, who his father was, but Callisto tells him that it was his father that brought her here and she's been waiting so long for Kratos to arrive. Her time is almost up, death is coming for her soon, but Callisto tells Kratos that his brother too suffers and doesn't have long left. It's a shock for Kratos, but Callisto tells him that Deimos still lives. All these years past have been spent in Death's domain, where he's been tormented and held prisoner. Their father had forced Callisto into silence, forced her to keep his identity and Deimos' fate a secret for all these years. At the Temple of Ares within Sparta, Kratos will find answers to where Deimos is. But Kratos can't help but act like, well, himself. Angry, full of resentment, even at his own mother. He demands to know why she kept this secret, and then he commands her to tell him the name of his father. With hesitation, Callisto complies. But before she can get out the entirety of a name, Callisto's voice is taken and she struggles, she thrashes and she changes. She will be punished for going against the will of Zeus, for trying to betray his secret. Callisto is changed into a hideous beast and Kratos is forced to take up arms against his own mother. She's vicious, unthinking and unrelenting. For trying to help her son, this is to be her punishment. This is a woman who, for most of her life, held difficult secrets, yet managed to raise Kratos alone. Even as a child, he was difficult, and he was angry. After Deimos was taken, she did what she had to, to keep Kratos safe. After Kratos brings the beast down and Callisto has her senses again before death takes her, she once again begs him to find and help Deimos. Her final words are of this request. Callisto dies in the arms of her son in a place far from home. For Kratos, there would be no reprieve from this loss or his anger. 
He had far to go in order to reach Sparta. Exiting the Temple of Poseidon brings Kratos face to face with the Scylla once again. Though this time it will act as a transport for the god to a volcanic land mass holding a secret within it. Breaking through exterior obstacles, Kratos finds within a titan, this one called Thera. She claims that Gaia, the grandmother of Zeus, who raised the god king, foretold that one like Kratos would come to aid and free the titans. How interesting. Kratos rejects this role, but Thera doesn't argue. She says he needs her help and her power. His path has led him here, so his objection matters not. If he doesn't cooperate, then he'll die with her. And in the truest of Kratos fashion, he doesn't free Thera, at least not in the way that she wanted him to. He takes from her the power stored within her body by ripping it out of her chest, imbuing his weapons with it. Enraged at his insolence and denying her demands, Thera rips her arms out of the chains and begins to take swings at the god of war, until her chains don't allow her any more movement. Seems Gaia's prophecy was either made up or made of straw. At the volcano's core, the Scylla once again ambushes Kratos and drags him into the sea. The two have their dalliance through the waves and a spat on the land, but the Scylla finally meets its end at the sharp end of a massive drill. Poseidon's guardian is dead, leaving Atlantis and his temple truly exposed. It would seem that Thera's thrashing and destruction of the volcano interior is causing waves. An eruption is beginning, and the entirety of the volcano seems to be falling into it. An explosion on the exterior shoots the god of war unceremoniously towards the neighboring Isle of Crete, garnering him a front row seat to the mayhem that he has created. The eruption will cause the ocean to swell, Atlantis will be consumed by it. The Isle of Crete too will suffer a cataclysm, but Kratos cares not. His only concern now is reaching Sparta. At a small temple to Athena within the burning Crete, Kratos screams at a statue of the goddess, demanding to know why they didn't tell him that his brother was still alive, why he's been lied to almost all his life. But Athena's vague warnings about rage and there being things that he doesn't know are all just kind of grating at this point. He's had enough with her dancing about the truth and keeping secrets. He destroys her statue and proceeds on his own. What survivors remain here are left to fight for themselves. If they happen to find themselves in Kratos' path, he has no problem simply outright killing them. What would be the point in helping them anyways? They're of no consequence to him. At the gates to the island, Kratos finds something that does give him pause though. A butchered unit of soldiers with only one left alive. The unnamed soldier holds the mutilated body of one of his companions. He hums to them, tries to comfort the corpse. Drawing closer, Kratos sees the man's eyes have been torn out, and he's not much longer for this world. The dying soldier has a message for the ghost of Sparta. The daughter of a god did this, and left this man alive to tell Kratos that the labor begins. Death awaits him, and he will never gain access to death's domain. Kratos will not be swayed from his goal, regardless of who's making threats at him. Nothing changes. His journey continues on. Within the capital city of the Isle of Crete, Kratos once again encounters the strange gravedigger from Athens who is so much more than he seems. He calls Kratos a fool, the biggest of them all, who leaves only destruction in his wake, a grand ruiner of lives. What Kratos has done to Atlantis will garner him the ire of Olympus. Kratos took the power he was offered as the new god of war but doesn't want to play nice with the other kids in Olympus. Though he couldn't possibly know that the evils of Pandora's box will fester into fear, paranoia, and hatred, Kratos carries himself as though eliciting those feelings is a goal of his. He's a one-track mind sort of fellow, just adding to his natural charisma and his charm. The gravedigger has not yet played out his hand, hasn't revealed to Kratos who he really is. He's quite certain that Kratos will not find Deimos, no matter how hard he tries, and what he brings to others will be what he finds at his own journey's end, ruin. He gives him a final warning, do not seek the domain of death. But his mother Callisto had told Kratos to return to Sparta to seek out Deimos, so he will not waver from that path. Near the exit of Crete's capital city, a monument reminds Kratos of a part of his own past. He remembers sparring with his brother Deimos when they were kids. He frequently overpowered his younger, smaller brother, but Deimos always got to his feet after, ready to try again. Beyond the city lies the Mount of Arawania, a difficult path that leads to Sparta. Within this mountain, the youth of Sparta would test their strength and their mettle. Failing in these mountains meant certain death. And not far into the mountains, Kratos finds the one who's been killing soldiers in order to find him. She is Aranus, daughter of Thanatos, the god of death. She's torturing a Spartan soldier who refuses to disclose where Kratos could be. She leaves before Kratos arrives, but the two are united within the mountain roads. Aranus is the embodiment of cruelty and evil. 
As the messenger of her father, she will do anything to accomplish her task with no remorse or regret. She's here to stop Kratos from meddling in Demos's fate, stop him from reaching Death's domain. In her human form, she is far more than any mortal could handle. For the god of war, she's a righteous brawl. The two rip and tear at one another until Kratos has ripped off her wings, but this isn't her true form. Aranus is far more than she may seem at first. The daughter of death takes to the sky and her true form. Seamlessly, she transforms and returns, eventually breaking down the bridge Kratos stood upon to make him easier prey. The two fight and fly over the entirety of the mountain range. When Kratos digs his weapons into her back and finally brings her down, they crash land into the forests near Sparta. On the ground, Kratos kills the daughter of death and takes power from her corpse. Her father will know of her death and will assuredly seek vengeance. But for now, Kratos is near his goal, at least his first one. Sparta is not far away. Memories of his mortal life reside within the city walls of Sparta. He's not sure what he's seeking out, but Kratos wanders the streets, walking amongst his people for a short time. When he's come to his childhood home, it's in a state of disrepair, abandoned, with no one to call it home anymore. And Kratos remembers the day that two gods attacked Sparta and took Deimos, believing him to be a prophetic marked warrior that would one day bring about the ruin of Olympus. This was done under the order of Zeus. Even before Pandora's box was opened, he was paranoid and fearful of being dethroned by one of his own kin. Deimos paid the price for that paranoia, and now all these years later, Kratos is seeking to undo it in some way. Changes are coming to Sparta, specifically at the Temple of Ares, where a monument dedicated to the former god of war is being torn down. One of their own, a Spartan, has ascended to fulfill that role, much to the joy and honor of his fellow Spartans. Statues will go up in his honor now, and he will be worshipped as a god. Within the temple is a reminder of who and what Kratos has become, the very thing that he once despised. Seeing statues to Ares forces him to remember who he once was, a mighty warrior that wanted glory for Sparta. Now he was the god of war. He acted in his own self-interest regardless of the consequence. Kratos was a hypocrite and a fool. He was just like Ares. Within the temple, Kratos is forced to face himself. At first a reflection that tries to pull him into the mirror, then himself as a child. When rage really began to settle into him, when his personality truly formed. He was always angry and always difficult, but once Deimos was gone, there was nothing to temper it. Kratos must fight off his ghost from the past, and while some may give pause to brutalizing their child self, Kratos doesn't hesitate. He savagely destroys it, taking from it the skull of Ceres. Back at Atlantis, he'd read about this. It would open the path to the domain of death. Aranus had fought savagely to prevent him from reaching it. This was why his mother told him to leave Atlantis and to come back here, to get this very object. Now it's time to return to Atlantis. Leaving Sparta, Thanatos himself intervenes, taking over the corpses of dead soldiers to issue warnings to Kratos. Because the best way to stop Kratos is to tell him that something is forbidden, right? Well, no, of course not. Thanatos is wasting his breath and just making Kratos more angry by getting in the way. Why does everyone have to yell and argue around here? The journey back to Atlantis is long, fraught with danger, and requires indifference to the suffering of others. No one better suited for that than Kratos. A ship awaits him at long end, ready to take him close to the sunken city that is still causing a massive disturbance in the ocean. This is a certain death sentence to all the men aboard, but Kratos will not see their ends. After holding off the forces of Poseidon, he is pulled into the deep waters, down, 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 into the broken city. In the flooded depths of Atlantis, a broken statue of Poseidon greets Kratos and he's angry. He vows vengeance for what he has done to his kingdom, but he doesn't remain for a screaming match. He's to the point with his threat before storming out, and now Kratos is near his goal. Past the many trials of Atlantis, Kratos once again meets Athena, who continues to harp on at him about turning back, that no good could possibly come from all of this, tactics proven again and again to be ineffective with Kratos. But finally she discloses that Deimos was seen as a threat to Olympus. This kicks up part of his memory. He can see Athena riding with Ares. And while she regrets it now, apologizing to a man like Kratos seems a fool's errand. She reasons that she wasn't there to help Deimos. She was there for Kratos, to keep him alive. She riddles that there's more to this than he realizes, but fails to offer information. Kratos issues her a warning to stay out of his way, and at least for now, she obliges. 
It takes time and patience, but Kratos is eventually able to remake a path to the door that he seeks to death's domain. This place is older than the gods of Olympus. It exists outside the realm of the gods and mankind, one of the most feared places in all of existence. This is the purgatory that Thanatos resides over. Deep into the temple of Thanatos, Kratos finally finds him, Deimos. The markings on his body are undeniable. Kratos frees him from his bones and rushes to his side, assuring this man that he does not know that he's safe now. But Deimos has harbored resentment towards Kratos all his adult life, believing that Kratos abandoned him to this fate like a coward, left him here to rot in torment. Deimos was the calmer of the two in childhood, but now he's just as wild as Kratos in his rage. Deimos attacks Kratos with surprising vigor for a man who's been imprisoned for so long. While Kratos has become a god, Deimos himself is a demigod. Deimos, too, is the son of Zeus, so when the two brothers fight, it's not a simple spat like when they were kids. They knock out walls and clobber each other with intense anger. Kratos doesn't want to kill Deimos, though. He wants to save him. So when Deimos gets the upper hand and starts beating the piss out of Kratos, he still doesn't bring out the murder tools. It is the god of death, Thanatos, that breaks the two up. Lest anyone forgets, Kratos killed his beloved daughter, and Deimos is his to torment and keep. To punish Kratos for the death of Aranus, Thanatos takes Deimos to the edge of the temple and plunges with him down into the suicide bluffs far below. Beaten and bloodied, Kratos picks himself up to follow his brother, still hell-bent on saving his life. And with no hesitation, he takes the plunge into the unseeable. Below on the suicide bluffs, he finds Deimos fighting for his life against Thanatos. With haste, he makes his way up to them, but he doesn't have very long. Partway through the ascent, Thanatos pushes Deimos to the ledge, leaving him dangling helplessly as bait for Kratos. It works, though. Kratos rushes headfirst towards his brother, completely ignoring that the god of death still looms nearby. Saving Deimos from falling seems to calm him for a bit. These two really are a couple peas in a weird pod, wildly unstable and unpredictable men. They talk as comrades with the tone of two men about to rip each other's guts out, but at least for now they're willing to lock arms as brothers. This must be what happy looks like for these two. They make it about 50 feet together before Thanatos intervenes once again. He is beyond the rule and influence of Olympus. Thanatos knows of all their doings and their schemes, but has no investment in it. He knows well the Oracle's prophecy given to Zeus that a marked warrior would be the undoing of Olympus. And it's rather amusing that he has the two of them before him now. Clearly, though, Ares chose the wrong brother when he abducted Deimos. And then an interesting name drop, the Sisters of Fate. Thanatos says that Kratos has no control over what he does because the gods decide and the Sisters of Fate enforce. Because of this, Kratos is a pawn in a game that he doesn't even realize is being played. Athena has alluded to this a few times in her own weird, vague ways, but Thanatos is the first to actually say it and I wonder if that will have any repercussions later. As was inevitable, Kratos and Deimos engaged Thanatos in a battle. His daughter was quite like him, a devastating opponent in their humanoid form. He's a lot to handle even for both Deimos and Kratos working together. When they get the upper hand, he changes just like his daughter did, but his true form is far more ancient and harrowing, but so too is he far less mobile. There's a visceral back and forth between the two sides, with Thanatos changing his form as needed during combat. When the brothers seem to be more than a match, Thanatos crushes Deimos at the height of the battle. A grievous blow that he doesn't rise from. Kratos enters a state of heightened rage, drawing upon his powers as a god to beat Thanatos down on his own. The ancient god of death struggles to breathe and taunts Kratos as he descends upon him. But he doesn't beg or ask for mercy. Thanatos is quite cruel with his words. He knows he's going to die, and he's going to sink whatever insult he can into Kratos before he does. He meets his death with a smile, leaving Kratos to see to his fallen brother. Deimos died on impact when Thanatos crushed him against the cliffside. There will be no closure, no goodbye. Like his wife and his daughter, he was there one moment and then gone the next. Kratos picks up the body of his little brother and begins to walk the steps of the suicide bluffs up to the path of solitude. At the top, Kratos once again meets the grave digger, who stands ready with a fresh grave for Deimos. Without question, Kratos lays his brother to rest. He only has a few words to give this man that he hardly knew, but he doesn't stay long once Deimos is in the ground. Kratos stands alone at the cliffside, once again contemplating death. But what would be the point? He would be denied his own end, and there would be no paradise for him in death. He traded all that away long ago, and he finally asks himself aloud, what have I become? 
and the gravedigger wastes no time. He calls Kratos the destroyer. This time, it seems to really sink in for him. He's been called many things, but this time he listens, and he understands how terrible he has become. Athena's arrival is a poor, thought-out thing. She tells the god of war that he's let go of everything that made him mortal. What Ares was trying to do, as though his grief and his loss is something to be celebrated. Athena tries to imbue him with greater power, but Kratos refuses her and pushes back against her assertions. Kratos goes to return to his throne in Olympus, vowing to Athena that the gods will pay for the death of Deimos and his mother. The gravedigger, or rather, Zeus, sees to Deimos, and then to the corpse of Callisto. She is laid to rest beside her youngest son, and the strange man proclaims that now only one remains. Following the death of his brother, Kratos became ever more ruthless. With his Spartan armies, he conquered Greece to take his mind away from the horrible things that he had done. His hostility towards the other gods of Olympus drew their fervent ire. The effects of Pandora's box were deepening, their hatred and paranoia increased, their worst aspects becoming more pronounced. Within Athena, the fear of Kratos' bloodlust grew. It was she that granted him godhood. The other gods would blame her for Kratos. Athena told him that she couldn't protect him from the other gods much longer, but what a foolish thing to assume Kratos would be thankful for another person's protection. He ignored her pleading so that he might go enjoy the terrors of war in the city of Rhodes. Kratos lumbered over the city much like Ares had done to Athens, but during the battle, a bird descended from on high and took from Kratos part of his power. He believed it to be Athena conspiring against him. The bird went to the Colossus of Rhodes and imbued it with that power, bringing the statue to life so that it could stand against the god of war. As Kratos shrank back down to the size of a mortal man, the Colossus began to hunt for him. The city of Rhodes is now caught between an army and feuding gods. Its soldiers still fight on, but between the Spartans, Kratos, and now the Colossus, they stand very little chance at saving the city. The fight between Kratos and the Colossus takes place all across Rhodes. It's long and drawn out. They destroy everything they come close to in their efforts to kill one another. Deep into the night, a voice calls to Kratos from the sky. Zeus offers aid to the god of war. He offers him power. Zeus sends to Kratos the Blade of Olympus, the very weapon he used to end the great war between the Titans untold years ago. The king of the gods tells Kratos to infuse the weapon with his godly powers, to put all of his godhood into it, and then he will be able to slay the Colossus. With hardly a second thought, Kratos complies. He finds the Blade of Olympus and begins to drain himself of power, sending it into the blade instead. It eventually has the ability to break into the Colossus so Kratos can destroy it from the inside out. He succeeds, of course. He manages to absolutely demolish the thing. After his three-point landing, Kratos decides to start screaming at the sky about proof that he has a big dick, not paying attention to the massive hand that crushes him under its own weight and that of his ego. Since he's put all of his god powers into that sword, that smack can really hurt too, enough so that Kratos is actually pretty close to dying. To survive, he needs to pick up the Blade of Olympus and reclaim his godliness. Come to find out, and <laughs> who could have seen this coming? Zeus wanted to drain Kratos of his powers. He had sent that sword as bait that he knew Kratos couldn't refuse. The evils of Pandora's box had taken hold of Zeus. He was terrified of losing his power, his seat as the king of the gods. It had been foretold that one of his own, a marked warrior, would be the downfall of Olympus. And now that paranoia is in full swing. He couldn't not act against Kratos. He refused to let Ares' fate be his own as well. He gives Kratos one chance to vow obedience to him, but when his oblivious son refuses, Zeus strikes Kratos down. The falling god of war puts up a pathetic defense against the Almighty. Zeus quickly sees him run through with the blade, and with his demise, Zeus too brings a promise. All that Kratos has ever known will suffer now because of his sacrilege, and Kratos will never be the ruler of Olympus, though Kratos never stated that he wished to usurp Zeus. His paranoia will not let him believe anything otherwise. To Zeus, all Kratos does is to further a conspiracy to overthrow him. The hands of Hades greedily fetch Kratos when death takes him once again. But powerful forces outside of Olympus have been watching the world intently and know that Olympus is destined to change. Kratos could not be allowed to face death, and this time it is not an Olympian that would intervene. Amidst horrific flashes of his life, he hears a voice telling him that it will not be this way, and when he returns to his senses, Kratos finds himself before the Titan Gaia. 
the mother of Earth, the grandmother of Zeus. The Titans, not imprisoned within Tartarus or tortured by the Olympians, remained free because of their allegiance to Zeus. But now, Gaia says they can no longer sit back and watch what is taking place. Zeus must be stopped. His reign of paranoia against his kin must be stopped. And to do this, Kratos must find the Sisters of Fate, the same ones that Thanatos spoke of. He must undo what Zeus did to him. He must regain his immortality and his god powers. If he is not the god of war, then he cannot face down Zeus. But the sisters were loyal to Zeus. This would not be a request that Kratos just makes of them. He must be prepared to kill the sisters of fate themselves and take his powers back by force using their magics. He must go back in time to the moment that Zeus betrayed him and undo his own murder. Kratos climbs out of Hades once again and returns to the nigh-destroyed city of Rhodes. His Spartan army is in dire straits, but Kratos commands the single soldier that he finds to continue his fighting, to not surrender, and then return to Sparta to defend it. But he will not stay. He has greater things to see to than his own army. A Pegasus arrives that will carry him to where he needs to be. Very stubbornly, Kratos demands that the beast takes him to Olympus instead, but because he's no longer technically a god, he cannot enter Olympus. He has to play by Gaia's rules now. Well, not their goal. The two are stopped within an isolated mountainside, which is the lair of the titan Typhon. The frigid monstrosity pins the Pegasus, forcing Kratos to search the surrounding caverns for a way to get the pinned titan to move its hand. While there, Kratos meets Prometheus, who is a titan, believe it or not. After Zeus took his throne, Prometheus stole away fire and gifted it to mankind. And for this, Zeus saw Prometheus chained up here to be tortured. His immortality was taken from him, and every day an eagle would come to Prometheus and slowly consume his liver. Each night, he would be healed of his wound and the cycle would repeat. Prometheus begs Kratos to find a way to release him from this torment. Though he does not have a way to free Prometheus right away, a solution does come after further venture. From the eye of the great titan Typhon, Kratos takes a new weapon, Typhon's Bane. It will let Kratos shoot things at a distance, whereas before he was quite limited to melee combat. Returning to Prometheus, Kratos is able to gift him a true death. Prometheus could never have had freedom, not from Zeus. This is as close as he could ever be to free. As a gift for his aid, the ashes of Prometheus cling to Kratos, granting him power akin to a titan. He will need this for the journey to come. Kratos is able to use the rage of the titans to move the hands of Typhon and free the Pegasus. Now they can finally get back to the task at hand. The Isle of Creation is where Gaia wished for him to be sent. This is the home of the Sisters of Fate themselves. Waiting hostiles make the descent difficult and the Pegasus is killed during the fighting but Kratos manages to land it on one of the sisters' temples just off the main island. It's not where he needs to be, but it's close enough that a solution can certainly be found. When he gazes upon the Isle of Creation, Gaia tells him a bit about the Titans of old and Zeus's story, how his mother saved his life when he was a baby by stealing him away and feeding to his crazed Titan father a rock in his place. Gaia raised Zeus in secret for Rhea and blessed him with mighty powers. The first that he meets within this disconnected temple is a man named Theseus, and Kratos seems to know him, or at least know of him. Theseus would have thought Kratos to be the last person that he would find here, so this is a bit of a surprise for him. The two are far from friendly, throwing veiled insults at one another to demean their stations in life. Seems that Theseus works for the sisters, probably not a wise thing of him to disclose, and holds on him objects that would aid Kratos in making it to the mainland. To Kratos' credit, he does tell Theseus that if he lets him pass, then he won't kill him, but, well, a weakened Kratos is just too much for him to resist. Theseus just signed his own death warrant, didn't he? Kratos and Theseus have their fight, and it's not a bad one. Theseus is quite the combatant, but he doesn't really have a butt hair of a chance with Kratos. The Spartan kills him and takes from his wrist the Horse Keeper's Key, allowing him to proceed on. As he proceeds, Kratos garners the attention of the Titan Kronos. If Kratos kills Zeus, then Kronos is 100% on board and willing to help him however he can. He's been stuck carrying Pandora's temple on his back for probably thousands of years at this point. He could do with a change of scenery, and Zeus needs to die for that to happen. He gives to Kratos the last of his magics, Kronos' rage, another empowerment that will help Kratos succeed in the hardships to come. Moving mechanisms of the temple and using the key gives Kronos control over the massive steeds of time. These were gifts from Kronos to the sisters long ago when he tried to bribe them to change his own fate. Long story short, it didn't work. 
Moving the constructs out tightens the chains between the temple and the mainland, and it moves the temple closer to it. Moving back through the temple, he finds the Amulet of the Fates, which will allow him to manipulate the flow of time. And quite soon after this, he has his first interaction with one of the sisters, Lachesis. She tells him very much the same thing that others have told him. He will only find death at his journey's end. He can never have peace. His defiance is laughable. At this point, Kratos doesn't even bother arguing that much. He just yells a bit, and then he throws a fist. Conquering the remainder of the temple finally leads to the mainland. The first obstacle is a dank, wretched bog. Off in the distance, Kratos can see the spire that the sisters call home, but reaching it is going to be a slog. An old friend greets him here, the one who by all rights should have defeated Kratos in battle long ago, Ulrich, the barbarian king. Once upon a time, this champion of Hades raced against the younger Kratos to reach the Ambrosia of Asclepius, each intent on saving a loved one. They had a bitter fight and became enemies at the end of that venture. Later in life, Ulrich's barbarian horde overran Kratos' army and had Kratos pinned down for a killing blow. It was Kratos making that damned bargain with Ares that saved his own hide. Kratos killed Ulrich that day, yet here he is. After his death, Ulrich clawed his way out of Hades, fighting off its very guardians to make it here. He has the same idea as Kratos, find the sisters and change his fate. But the appearance of Kratos in his path almost seems like a divine gift. Kratos is the object of his vengeance, and now he gets a second chance at taking his head off. Ulrich proved himself once to be the better of Kratos. The only reason Kratos survived that day was because Ares saved his petty ass. And without the power of a god, Ulrich climbed out of hell itself to make it back here. He's a complete unit of a man. But the advantages that Kratos possesses are too much for the broken barbarian king to defeat. The once mighty champion of Hades falls after a great battle with Kratos, leaving behind his barbarian hammer, which Kratos will take for himself. Next before him are the ruins of the Forgotten. Getting within proves to be a huge test of patience. It's covered in servants of the sisters and puzzles. Dreaded, dreaded puzzles, Kratos' greatest foe. But there are prizes to be won along the way, even beyond the ruins, that make the struggles worth it. Kratos fights the queen of the Gorgons, Eurali. Turns out she's a bit upset about that one time Kratos killed her sister Medusa. He might have also killed her other sister too, but it's just so hard to keep track of all the murder these days, right? Eurali stalks and kills all who tread on her temple, and Kratos is no different. She tries to kill the Spartan, but in the end, he decapitates her and he takes her head. He can use this to turn certain enemies into stone. Then, within the halls of Atropos, Kratos meets another demigod, Perseus. Perseus wished to reach the Sisters of Fate to bring his beloved back to life, but he's been trapped here for some time. He's had to face test after test to get this far, and the sudden appearance of the Ghost of Sparta certainly seems to be another one. He's become a little bit out of touch, it seems, not really thinking things through logically. But even if Kratos wasn't sent as a test, at least he can find glory in killing Kratos. At least that's what he thinks. Perseus has a distinct advantage. He can go invisible, but he rather ruins it because, well, Perseus won't shut up. He needs to yell betrayals of his location, and whenever he runs, he leaves little footsteps in the water. It just takes time and patience, but Kratos eventually brutally kills the demigod and takes from him his shield. It will keep him safe from the effects of the Gorgon's gaze, preventing him from being turned into stone, a useful tool to be had for the journey ahead. A harrowing crossing of the broken down road through the lowlands leads Kratos to his goal, the Palace of the Fates. Except the bridge before it has completely busted out, there will be no swinging across this one. But the one called Icarus pops his head up, clearly insane and rambling at Kratos about never making it across. Kratos thinks he can, but oh no, no he cannot, idiot. The reason Icarus is so hellbent on Kratos staying here is because he thinks that this is his test and Kratos isn't allowed to do his test. He'll pass it and then the sisters will grant his wish, not Kratos, so Kratos needs to go away. Well, poor maddened Icarus. He just gave Kratos an idea. To cross the chasm, he'll need wings, so he'll take Icarus's wings. The two tussle down a long fall of the chasm and Kratos just brutally rips off Icarus's wings, just pulls them off like they're Velcro and lets Icarus tumble to the bottom of the depths, past the Titan Atlas, and into a bed of lava, screaming like a banshee the whole way down. Poor guy. Kratos too finds himself where Atlas struggles on, forced to hold the literal weight of the world on his shoulders. These two have had conflict in the past, but given their size differences and the struggle that Atlas is constantly experiencing, he can't really see Kratos. 
Even if he could, he can't act against him, given that his arms are a bit occupied holding up the world. When Kratos breaks one of his chains, giving him some temporary respite, Atlas is a bit taken aback, at least until he realizes that it's Kratos that broke the chain. Then he tries to crush him. But once Kratos starts screaming about Zeus betraying him and switching sides and wanting vengeance, Atlas starts listening. When Kratos screams to him the plans of wanting the Blade of Olympus, Atlas tells him a little story. He tells Kratos about the war between the Titans and the Olympians after Zeus freed his siblings from the guts of Kronos. It was a bitter war that raged for a decade until Zeus created the Blade of Olympus. It stole the Titans away and imprisoned them, with some getting their own unique forms of torture for the rest of eternity. Atlas hates Kratos, but if the former god of war is on a path against Olympus, then he can be convinced to aid him. Atlas gives him the Atlas Quake, which will let Kratos shake and rend the earth beneath his feet. He's garnered quite the collection of feats and powers now. Kratos asks Atlas how to reach the Sisters of Fate, but not even the Titans know exactly how to reach them. Atlas has given him the last of his magics, and he can help Kratos cross the Great Chasm before their palace, but that's all that he can do for him. Atlas gives Kratos a first-class seat back up through the earth to directly in front of where he needs to be. The Palace of the Sisters is quite reminiscent of Pandora's Temple. It's a death trap of puzzles, enemies, and weird corridors. The spire of the sisters where they reside is within view of the palace, but it's unreachable. The sisters seem quite fond of testing people, so Kratos has to play along and solve their palace puzzles, which includes delightful human sacrifices along the way, too, actually, and the resurrection of a phoenix, which is his ticket to the spire of the sisters. While checking through the last parts of the palace, Kratos finds a soldier shrouded in darkness. The soldier strikes against Kratos, refusing to allow another to take the path. He must reach the sisters, for there is something that he must change. Kratos cuts him down, bringing him to death's door, and then finds that he knows his face. He saw him in Rhodes. He's a Spartan soldier, and Kratos had ordered him to return to Sparta. But the soldier tells him that when he returned home, he found all of Sparta destroyed. Zeus had come into the city under the cover of night and attacked it himself. The city did not stand a chance. The soldiers had waited and prayed that Kratos, their god of war, would return to save them, but he never did. Sparta was left to defend itself against a god, but no defense could be created. The city was now in ruin. The last Spartan had barely survived and made the trek here to try and undo what Zeus had done, only to be cut down by Kratos himself. He tells the former god that he has faith that he will restore Sparta, and that the spirit of those who fell in battle will live on through him before he passes on. Enraged at the loss of Sparta and his own failure to protect it, Kratos screams at the sky once again. He wants to fight Zeus. He is willing to completely abandon the plan and the path that he's on for a few swings at the king of the gods. He also completely misses that the Kraken is behind him, and while the Kraken thrashes at the arena and him, Kratos instead stomps around mid-tantrum, still yelling at Zeus to face him. He has absolutely lost the plot and is hell-bent on a fist fight with Zeus. Gaia sees that now would be a good time to intervene. While the Kraken crushes him, she takes Kratos into his own mind and appears to him in the form of his departed wife. She assures him that victory favors him, and that while things may seem lost for now, he can still defeat Zeus, but he needs to get a grip. He needs to lead, he needs to hold his rage back, because if he fails in this venture, Zeus will never relent in hunting him down. And should he die, Hades will torture him for all eternity. Gaia imbues his body with the fire that burned Sparta to further empower his anger towards Olympus, and she steadies his mind with the promise that their battle with the gods truly begins now. And it works. Kratos snaps out of it and strikes out against the Kraken. It's a stupid, hulking creature that's not difficult to outmaneuver, and Kratos is so empowered at this point that he can inflict damage on it any way he needs to. He severs its limbs, cuts at its head, and once it's lost its grip on the palace, he extends a bridge and impales it through the face. Now he's free to proceed on to the phoenix. It doesn't allow him easy passage, the beast has to be wrangled into submission. But he convinces it to give him a ride to the spire of the sisters. It takes him all the way to the top of the spire, to the temple of the fates, where just beyond is the throne of Lachesis, one of the sisters. She's watched his progress through the palace, even helped guide him in a few spots. But to the sisters, Kratos is an amusement. No one can change their fate, yet he tries so hard to do so. She promises that there are none as powerful as the sisters, and that if he challenges them, then he will die. 
Well, certainly a number of individuals have promised him death. So what's a few more? Kratos challenges Lachesis, who measures the threads of their loom and decides how long a life will be. She has no fear of Kratos. Never before has a god, titan, or mortal compromised the work of the fates or challenged their superiority. For them, it has always been as they determined fate to be. When Kratos bests Lachesis in a fight, she calls upon her sister Atropos to aid her. She is the eldest, and the sister which cuts the threads of each life, ending each existence herself. Atropos takes Kratos into a mirror, taking him to another time and another place. It's the Bay of Athens, when he fought Ares after opening Pandora's box. Atropos threatens that they can take this giant sword away, the one that he had used to kill Ares. They can change his past, change his destiny if they so choose. Kratos does everything he can to stop her as she breaks down the sword. Kratos beats back her minions to interrupt her attacks. Atropos is not as hardened for combat as her sister, and is stopped from changing the past after a brief beatdown. Kratos is returned to the throne room for another round of pain, this time with Atropos trying to break through the mirrors around the room. Stopping time using the Amulet of the Fates is the only way that he can stop her in time, lest she emerge and raise havoc on the field as well. After repeating the cycle several times, Lachesis takes a wild leap for Kratos to impale him, but whoops, instead she strikes her own sister through the head. Kratos then does the same to Lachesis and pushes her into Atropos's mirror. While she's there, Kratos destroys the mirror, trapping the two in another time and another place. Beyond the throne room is the final chamber, the loom chamber, where the gargantuan sister Clotho remains. She's hideous and terrifying to behold. Clotho is the youngest of the sisters, who creates the thread for their loom and determines when life begins. Once inside Clotho's chamber, Gaia tells Kratos he must find his thread and use their mirrors to change his fate. The mirrors are the source of the sisters' powers, and he can use them to return to the time and place when Zeus betrayed him. Clotho and the loom are protected by machinations and puzzles that make it difficult to ascend, and the sister herself aids in that frustration by taking wild swings at Kratos as he goes. And when he does reach the top of the loom chamber, Clotho doesn't hesitate in attacking. She is not at all mobile and lacks the speed that her sisters possessed in their attacks, but Clotho is a unit, nigh impossible for Kratos to cut down with his small weaponry. His only chance is using the environment, utilizing hazards meant to stop intruders against Clotho. Bringing up a massive blade and controlling time, Kratos is able to drive it into Clotho's skull, killing the Sister of Fate. She will be the only of the sisters to die this day, but all their powers have effectively been stripped away and laid before Kratos. He now has full access to the loom chamber and the mirrors within. Kratos feeds threads into their machinery until he sees the moment that he seeks, the moment that Zeus betrayed him. Locking in, he's able to travel through the mirror and revisit the moment in time. When he emerges, he sees himself being killed just as before. He is a second Kratos in the scene. He charges Zeus, interrupting the murder, and the King of Olympus reasons what's happened very quickly. This is because of the Sisters of Fate. Though it's a surprise when Kratos tells him that he killed the sisters. Possessing his many empowerments gained from his long journey and now holding the Blade of Olympus, Kratos can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Zeus once again. Zeus flies them away to the Summit of Sacrifice, where they can have their battle uninterrupted. Though the God King takes a greater, mighty form, Kratos handles him like he was meant to do this. When he gets a good opening, Kratos plunges the blade into Zeus's hand, draining from him enough power to bring the God back down to size again. Zeus is far from down though, and with enough time, he recovers enough to grow in size once more. But then, Kratos lays down his arms. He stops fighting, and he moves away from the blade. Falling to his knees, Kratos asks Zeus to free him from the torment of his life. He asks the God King to kill him, once and for all, to end this darkness. But Zeus, he just cannot leave well enough alone. He tells Kratos that he will kill him, and that his torment is just beginning. Well, wrong answer. Zeus could have ended things there, but his mouth just couldn't keep shut. The surprise of Kratos' quick retaliation caught him off guard, and the former god of war is able to start cutting holes into him with his blades. It could have been so simple an end, but instead Zeus's hands are impaled and Kratos takes back the blade of Olympus. When he starts sawing through Zeus like a log, Athena descends and interferes with their fight. She doesn't want to fight Kratos, but she will do so to defend the status quo within Olympus, to save Zeus's life. When Kratos takes the final lunge towards the injured king, Athena instead intercepts the strike, 
taking a grievous wound. Athena and Kratos were at times hostile with one another, but Athena understood the bad hand that Kratos had been dealt by the gods. She wanted to help him heal some of his pain, give him a new purpose as the god of war. But she couldn't stop Zeus's fear and paranoia, his urge to destroy Kratos. And she couldn't stop Kratos's rage after each tragedy ensued. Athena finally tells Kratos that Zeus is his father. And she asks him to stop this cycle that the gods are in of sons killing fathers. But Kratos rejects Zeus as his kin and will not acknowledge their blood ties. The cycle will not end here. As she starts to pass, Athena warns him that the other gods of Olympus will seek revenge if Kratos kills Zeus. But this, it's fine by him. If they'll get in the way of his vengeance, then they will die. The time of the gods has come to an end. He has control over the sister's loom, therefore he controls time. Kratos returns to the spire of the fates and turns it far, far back to the great war between the Titans and the Olympians. There he meets Gaia, and he calls upon her to return to his time with him. The Titans can still yet win against the Olympians, but not at this time. Kratos takes all the Titans from the field before Zeus can steal them away into imprisonment. Back in his proper present time, Zeus sits before his kin in Olympus, discussing how to handle Kratos. He beseeches the gods to put aside their differences and to unite in destroying the god of war. Yet as he grandstands, the ground begins to shudder and bend, drawing their eyes away from Olympus, far into the fog below. The Titans have come, with Kratos at their side. They've come to finish the war started so long ago.